Well, good Monday evening to you. Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, and put your bookmark in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. That's, uh, that's where we'll spend our time this evening, and so uh, I hope you'll be turning there. We welcome you. I know there are a lot of things that you could be doing this evening, a lot of things that vie for our attention. Uh, I, I mean, the, the Dallas Cowboys are playing football right now, so that just in and all of itself is probably the great temptation for all of you, right, uh, <laughs> to be at home this evening. Uh, I, I, gospel meetings uh, have changed a lot through the years. You know, the, the days, some of you might remember the uh, old two-week meetings where uh, folks would, uh, would meet every day for 14 days. And uh, I, I just missed out on that. Uh, but I can remember uh, lots of full-week meetings, even 10-day meetings that would encompass both weekends. And, and things have just changed a lot. We're, we're busy. And... Uh, there are a lot of things that vie for our attention, and uh, so uh, I appreciate that you're here and that you're interested in things that are spiritual, and I hope that our study uh, will be worth your while. I've enjoyed being with you. I've enjoyed being in Arizona. Y'all have a beautiful state, and uh, uh, not everybody thinks that uh, when they come out to the desert, but uh, boy, I, I have really enjoyed it, and I've appreciated all of your kindness. Uh, we talked yesterday uh, somewhat about the influence of culture on us, and I kind of want to start there again uh, this evening. I, I tell you, there, there's been a kind of an interesting transition, both in the religious world and in the non-religious world, at least from my observation, and I look at the world kind of weird sometimes, uh, uh, as it pertains to uh, the miraculous you know, it, it, it was the time, it, there was a time not too long ago, probably within three or four decades, where there were very few religious bodies in this country, religious denominations, who accepted the idea that God works in kind of miraculous ways in this day and age. That, that was pretty much limited to the kind of Pentecostal uh, uh, groups or those that had connections to that. Uh, and, um, and, and most of the rest of the world, uh, you, you know, they accepted that, that that was a part of the religious background, that that was a part of the Bible. Uh, and, and what we've seen is a kind of an interesting uh, parting of ways as our culture has become more and more educated and more and more impressed with ourselves, with our education. Uh, the, the idea that there's ever been any validity to the miraculous has, has been pretty much dismissed. I, I mean, have you ever studied with somebody who, who told you, do you really believe all that stuff really happened in the Bible? Do you really believe, and this is the one that always gets me, do you really believe that in the Garden of Eden, Adam and, and Eve were talking to a snake? Uh, and, and I always go, yeah, do you talk to your dog? And, and that, then, we can move, <laughs> then we can move right on from that. But the reality is as we become a, a, a more educated people uh, and, and people are becoming more and more skeptical about God, about the Bible, about the reality of all that, the, the idea that God ever imposed His power upon this world is, is, is something that causes people to dismiss uh, religion. On the other side of the spectrum, what's happened is almost every religious organization has accepted in some way or another the idea that God's working in miraculous ways, or at least the Spirit is working in ways other than through the Word, and that's become a, a commonplace acceptance. So you've got a big segment of our society that, that the miraculous is just, you're crazy if you think that. You're backward, uh, you're uneducated, you, you're, 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 just, you're just hung up in the Neanderthal age. And then you've got all the religious people over here who, who act like everything that happens is a miracle. And, 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 and there is a polarization. Am I the only one that sees this? Do you notice this? Uh, shake your head yes, okay? I'm gonna, I want you to understand something about our faith, those of us who are trying to follow God. We have to accept as true the events of the Scriptures that involve the miraculous. Uh, it, it is fundamental to our conviction about God and Jesus Christ that God has proven Himself in this world by means of powers that are not of this world. And, 
And, and, and that's something we're going to have to grapple with. As we study with people, as we talk with people who, who, who reject the Bible, who reject religion, we cannot cower when they bring up, do you believe in miracles? Or at least that the miracles happened then. I, we have to embrace that and we have to see the importance of it. We talked about it yesterday with regards to Elijah and Elisha. I want you to notice how significant were the, the, the miraculous things that God did through Jesus in His life. Matthew chapter 14, Jesus walks on the water and then calms the storm. And the people that were in the boat, they were impressed by that. Hey, I know this is a desert. Any of you ever been on the water in a storm? Uh, I, I came across Sabine Lake with a friend of mine one day. In, in, in fact, it was John Banks' dad. Uh, and, and the waves were about four or five foot high, and we were in a little old 15 foot boat, and we thought we were going to die. And I was as scared as I've ever been in my life. Uh, and, and the idea that, that the Lord could stand up and say, Peace be still, and it was completely calm. Water doesn't go completely calm all of a sudden. It doesn't. Even when the storm passes, it's going to take a while for that to calm down. That impresses me. And those people that were in the boat in Matthew chapter 14 said, Truly, you are the Son of God. In John chapter 6, Jesus takes a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And, and He starts breaking them. But you ever tried to illustrate that? Take a piece of paper sometime and, and see how long it goes till you don't have any more paper. And Jesus does that for thousands of people. And when He is finished, they want to take Him and make Him the King. And, and, and they are very, very definitive in their conclusion. This is the prophet that, that Moses was talking about. This is the one. Look at what He has done. John chapter 3. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Uh, most famous because He comes at night. And, and, and basically, He is an honest man because He tells the Lord... Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. No one can do the things that you're doing unless God is with him. John chapter 7. Uh, Jesus uh, is in the temple uh, on the, the high day of the, of, of the Feast of Lights. And, and the, uh, the people are around and He's been teaching them and He calls out to them and quotes uh, about rivers of life, rivers of water springing up from within unto eternal life. And those people are listening to Him and looking at Him and they're watching what's going on and their conclusion is, this has to be the Christ. The people that saw the miracles had no doubt about what the miracles meant. And they're just as important to us. Now, when John writes about the miracles, and we're going to study from Matthew, but when John writes about the miracles, John talks about the miracles as it pertains to what they said about Jesus. In fact, his conclusion is, while Jesus did a lot of other things that aren't written, he says, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing have life in His name. And so he calls the miracles signs. I, I, I want to kind of build on that. But instead of going to John, I, I want you to notice some of the things that we learn from the miracles of Matthew chapter 9. That they are signs. But they are signs not only of who Jesus was. That's what John was uh, addressing. They are also signs to us today about the significance of Jesus and, and our faith. And so, go back to Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to look at three or four, depending on how much time we have, uh, of, of the miracles that, that we find in this chapter. And, and I want to draw some conclusions with you that I hope will be helpful to you. But the first thing that I want you to notice about the miracles, and, and we'll see this in the first miracle here in, John, in Matthew 9. I, I want you to notice that the miracle that Jesus performs in, in this context uh, is important to us because it helps us to understand that Jesus has the power to forgive our sins. That the message of the gospel, the theme of the gospel, uh, is, is, is forgiveness. Uh, Paul tells the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. The, the reality is forgiveness is the one thing that God uh, needs, that we need, that, that we can't provide for ourselves. We can't undo disobedience. And, and once we have sinned, read James chapter 1, James, uh, James chapter 2, James makes this argument that, that if you commit one sin, you're guilty before the law. Um, 
If I was, I'm, I'm just staying right around the corner over here. If I, if I was late for services and jumped in the car and came flying down, what's this road right out here? McDowell, something like that. And I'm driving about 70 miles an hour because I'm late. And a, a, a nice uh, local police officer pulls me over. Uh, Mr. Bowman, wh what are you doing? Well, I'm late. I've got to go preach. Uh, and, 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 and he says, well, you know you were doing 70 in a whatever, 30, 35, 40 mile an hour. Well, yes, sir, but I'm late. And he, he says, well, I'll tell you what. You know, my, my dad was a preacher, and he was late all the time. I, I'm just going to let you go. I'm not going to write you a ticket. Well, well, thank you, sir. That's awful kind of you. Am I guilty? Yeah. Now, I might not have to pay for my guilt, but I'm guilty. Now, you tell me, what can I do to change that state? Nothing. It is the one aspect of our service to God that you and I have absolutely no power to fix. And we understand that association with God is something that is on His terms. He, he demands holiness. He is a holy being. He cannot tolerate sin in His presence. And so what do we do about that? Well, that's the thrust of the gospel. I, I, I don't know everybody here. I don't know if there are visitors here that aren't Christians. Maybe you've come because you've been invited by someone here. I want you to appreciate that while the religious world is promoting all kinds of stuff in the name of religion, all kinds of social programs, all kinds of fix this and fix that, what God has done through Jesus Christ is offer you forgiveness. It is the great appeal of the gospel. And, and we all need it. Because the reality is that uh, guilt is a horrible thing to live with. Now, now there are a lot of passages that we could address. Uh, Romans chapter 7 is an interesting passage where Paul talks about wanting to do what is right but not doing what is right and what a wretched man that he is. Do you understand that? I want to do what's right but sometimes I fail and, and, I'm, and it makes me miserable and it weighs on me. One of my favorite passages in that regard is in Psalm 51 where David is appealing to God for God's mercy and David's already, as best I can understand, been forgiven. And yet he says, my sin is ever before me. God cleanse me. God purify me. Create a clean heart in me. I'm going to tell you, guilt is a horrible thing to carry around. And you and I don't have to. That doesn't argue that you and I will never sin again. But we don't have to, we don't have to allow guilt to dominate our lives. And that's an important thing to appreciate. It is the great appeal that God offers. But there is a, there's an obstacle when it comes to forgiveness that God looks at me as an innocent being. It's hard for me to grapple with because I know what my weaknesses are. You know what yours are. But here's the obstacle. How do we know that we're forgiven? I, I know I'm guilty. And God sends Jesus. Jesus lives a perfect life. Jesus dies on the cross. Jesus tells me, I'm, I'll forgive you if you'll fulfill the conditions I'm placing on this. I will, I will consider you innocent. How do you know? I'm not, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question worth asking. Because uh, I, I need to know. I, I want to be able to, to pillow my head at night and and not be scared about what happens if I die. I, I want to be able to serve God with the conviction that God really has forgiven me and God really does treat me as a son and I really do have association with God. What's the proof? Well, some people say, well, you know, I just feel it in my heart. <laughs> I hear this pretty regularly. Oh, listen, I accepted Jesus into my heart and I just felt it. I felt it from that moment on. I, I just feel forgiven. You know, feelings are, uh, are interesting things. Uh, we were talking at supper tonight. Uh, I have three daughters and a wife, so I live with four women. Let me tell you something about emotion, okay? <laughs> I, I can remember when my oldest daughter uh, was, I don't know, 11, 12 years old. I came home from work one day and she is laying on her bed sobbing and I... She was the first person I saw when I came in, and I, I was just sure that somebody had died. Something horrible had happened. 
Because she is just, she, she's just uh, inconsolable. Haley, what's wrong? She just, she just shakes her head. Just bawling. Haley, what's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. She finally looks up at me and said, I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> and, and you know, this is my first daughter. And, and I, just, I just sat there for the longest time looking at her trying to process this. I finally told her, I said, would you make something up? Because I can't fix. I can't fix, I don't know. Well, I'm going to tell you, that's the way emotions can be. You know, you get up some days, you feel great. You get up some days, you feel terrible. But nothing's happened to cause that. And, and, and we go through life with these emotional swings. We don't always understand them. Are they, are they hormonal? Does it have to do with, with body chemistry? What, is, is, it, is it psychological? I don't trust too much some, the, the idea that I'm forgiven because I feel it. Because I'm going to tell you something, folks. Grappling with my issues, the, 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 more, the more real scenario is I know I'm forgiven, but I still pretty, feel pretty bad about myself. You ever feel that? So are feelings the way that we know that we're forgiven? So somebody else might say, well, you know... Uh, uh, the, the Spirit has, 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 has uh, overtaken me. Man, that's another tricky one. In fact, that's very hard to separate from emotion. And, and, it, and it's not a biblical concept that God somehow or the other is doing something better felt than told inside of us. I understand there are different views about, about the idea of the down payment or the earnest of the Spirit. But the idea that the Spirit is, is talking to me inside and has convinced me that I'm forgiven is, is just not a biblical concept. Somebody else say, well, my preacher told me so. <laughs> I really like that one. Because I want to go, well, I'm a preacher, and I'm telling you you're not. And, then, and people don't know what to do with that, you know, uh, because you're the preacher. And for some reason or the other, people think you know something because you're the preacher. My question is, how do we know we're forgiven? Jesus got into a boat and crossed over and came to His own city. And behold, they brought to Him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Some of the scribes said within themselves at once, This man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your heart? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you, or to say arise and walk? Now stop right there. Do you appreciate that Jesus is dealing with the very issue that we are addressing right now? The answer to the question, how do I know I'm forgiven, is a very simple answer. It is, I know because of my faith. Uh, Hebrews tells us that... Uh, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that you can't see. And people in the world will go, yeah, that's a typical religious answer. All you religious folks, you think faith is the answer to everything because you can't prove faith either. Yes, I can. Because Jesus on this occasion takes the opportunity when there's this paralyzed man and this is where they have let him down through the roof. And if you read... The other gospel accounts, you pick up some of the details. They've laid him down through the roof, and it says that Jesus seeing their faith. It's not even this man's faith that's involved. And Jesus seeing their faith says to the man, your sins are forgiven, and, and, and the, the Pharisees ha have a cow about that. And, and Jesus asks them the question, is it easier to prove my power with a, a miracle of healing or forgiveness? And the answer is, Oh, it's a, lot, it, it, it's a lot easier to say your sins are forgiven because you can't prove it. Now start reading again, verse 6. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now, I want you to understand something, folks, about the way God has worked in proving Himself to us. And... This is interesting because as far as I'm concerned, God shouldn't have to prove anything to us. He's God, we are not. But, but it says something about His goodness and His mercy that He goes out of His way to do things in such a way that, that it helps us to have confidence. 
you and I can know our sins are forgiven. And that Jesus has the power to do so because He proved it right here. If I can do this, if I can cause this man to walk, then I can forgive sins. And that's the point He's making. And He challenges them on that. And, and you'll notice, they don't argue with Him. Well, how are you going to argue against that? I want you to appreciate how important it is that, that we understand the, these, these things that Jesus did because they're very practical for us. They don't just say He was the Son of God. They also say, you and I can pillar our head at night and know that we're forgiven. And so, so if you're not a Christian, I want you to understand something about the gospel of Jesus Christ. When, when God offers salvation and forgiveness, He's, He's not offering a pipe dream. It's not some pie-in-the-sky thing that you can never prove that you have to have some kind of better felt than told experience so you can live with some confidence in, in, in God's forgiveness. God proved to us that He forgives us when He tells us that He does. Let me offer you a second observation. The miracles of Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 also help us to understand that Jesus really does have the power to give life. Forgiveness is really the kind of thrust of the gospel, but I think the thing that appeals to us the most is the idea of, of living forever. I, I mean, man's always search for the fountain of youth, some way of never dying. Every culture has in its history some kind of, of, of mythology or some kind of, of, of religious reasoning that, that nearly always has as its end man's continuing to exist. Uh, John 3.16, God so loved the world, whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Does that appeal to you? Well, I, uh, you know, I don't know anybody that says, hey, I'm, I'm really looking forward to dying. It is against our nature. I, I, think, I think when we were created in the image of God in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, it's not only that we are a, a being of, of moral capability, a being with free will, uh, of being with emotions, of being with intellect, I think it also addresses that we were created to not die. Death is a result of sin. And now we have to deal with that. In Hebrews chapter 2, we are told that, that it is the fear of death that, that, that holds man in bondage. Uh, I can't think about this uh, without... When I, I, I preached in Texarkana for about eight years before I moved to Beaumont, and I was single for six of those years. Uh, and a friend of mine and I, we used, you know, single boys. I was 23, 24 years old. Uh, you're always looking, you know, uh, uh, for a date. And uh, we used to go eat, and then we'd, we'd hang out here and hang out there and watch the girls go by. And we, we were at the mall one evening, and uh, we looked down the, the mall ahead of us, and here's this petite, blonde-headed woman, pretty figure, and she's walking away from us. And she caught our attention, and, you know, guys, we're talking. Uh, and, and so we kind of start following along because we want to see. We, we, this has got to be a beautiful woman up ahead of us. And we walk along, walk along. Finally, she stops to look at something. We catch up to her. She turns around, and I promise that woman was 95 years old. <laughs> okay? Now, from behind, she looked good. She, she, was, she was taking care of herself. She was dressed stylishly. She, she had her hair bleached. Uh, she turned around. She had more makeup on than, than Dillard's has ever carried in a year. You, know, you want to know why? Because she didn't want to die. I mean, that's the reality of life. You, you get some disease and you go through all kinds of treatments. Why? Because you don't want to die. You, you put your seatbelt on when you get in the car. Do you remember when the seatbelt law came out? I was, I was in college and I can remember thinking, you're not going to tell me I have to wear a seatbelt. <laughs> you know? No, I wear them all the time. You know, put one on the dog when the dog's in the car. Why? Death scares us. And God offers eternal life. And, and I'll tell you something more than that that's imperative to appreciate. He offers eternal life in a very concrete way. Turn, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. God doesn't just offer eternal life in some kind of a fuzzy, uh, indefined, 
kind of kind of ethereal way. Yeah, yeah, I don't know how you envision heaven. You know, there's a lot of people that think of the spiritual world as as being kind of Casper the Friendly Ghost, uh, and 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 that there's not substance to it. You know, you, you you can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't test it the way we do empirical things. And in fact, I had a discussion with somebody just a couple of weeks ago. That they were talking about the resurrection, and that uh, that that he, he said there's not a there's not a body. I said, well, the Bible says there's a body. Yeah, but it's not a real body. Well, it's not a flesh and blood body. But I want you to listen to what Paul says to these brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he is using the resurrection of Jesus to prove our own. And then he takes it one step further and talks about the nature of the resurrection. Begin reading uh, really probably in verse 39 where he says, All flesh is not the same kind of flesh. There's one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fish, another of birds. In other words, different kinds of bodies, different kind of skin, different kind of coverings. And then he goes on, verse 40, there are celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. You got the earth, you got the stars. Uh, the glory of the celestials, one, the glory of the terrestrials, another. Their appearance, their beauty is not the same. It's not the same substance. One glory of the sun, another of the moon, another of the stars. One star differs from another in glory. And then he says, this is the way the resurrection of the dead is. The body is sown, and I want you to get the image. He's, he's, he's talking about burial. It's planted. In, in fact, it would probably be the, the best translation for our minds, unless you're a farmer uh, and you understand what sowing is. The body is planted. It's buried, he says, in corruption. We know what happens to a physical body when you bury it. It decays. The, 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 the body is sown in, in corruption, but it's raised in incorruption. No more decay. It's planted or buried or sown in dishonor. Why, why, do we, why do we hide the bodies of the dead? Because we don't want to see that happening to, to, to our loved ones. There is nothing about it that, that brings any kind of, of, of honor. And so he says it's, it's planted in dishonor, but it's raised, he says, in glory. Beautiful word. The term that's always used to describe the appearance of God. It's sown, he says, uh, in weakness. A, a dead body can't do anything. But it's raised in power. And I don't know if this is exactly the application, but this is what I always think about. When Jesus was raised from the dead, Jesus was not subject to the physical laws as we know them. He appears, He disappears, he, he, He's there behind a closed door when He didn't come in through the door. I don't know if that's the idea, but what, what He's saying is, the body's going to be changed and it's no longer going to be a body that can't do anything. It is a body that, that is full of power. And he finally concludes, it, it's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, there is a spiritual body. You know what that means to me? That, that means that uh, in the resurrection, Everything that's good about the body we have now is, is something that we're going to enjoy at a level that we've never enjoyed before. You know why we have a body now? Well, we have a body so we can experience the world God created. So we can watch the sun come up and, 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 and ignite the, the tops of the mountains. That's a, that's a beautiful view that you get here. Uh, so, so you can hear music and, and relish it. So you can taste a chocolate chip cookie, which is just one of the best things in the world. You know? So, so, so you can feel uh, the, the skin of a baby. You, you know, all these things that we experience life with is the reason God gave us a body, so we can see the majesty and the glory of God. I, I think about that. That's the way I think about heaven. I don't know what heaven's going to be like, but it's going to be a place that we experience because we're going to have a body. And it's not going to be a float around on a cloud with... With, with, a, with a robe and wings and plucking on a harp for eternity. That doesn't appeal to me at all. It's going to be real. It's going to be something we experience. And I don't understand it all. I don't know if I'm going to get my hair back. I used to have real pretty long blonde hair. <laughs> you know, I don't know if we're all going to be at the height of our physical... I don't know and I don't care what God promises me. 
The older I get and the more my body starts deteriorating, the more the appeal is there. So it's not just eternal life that God offers. It's quality, eternal life. But here's the question. How do you know? I've never met anybody that was raised from the dead. Have you? Please, please nobody raise your hand right now. <laughs> I, I've, 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 never, I've never been around someone who, who had a perfected spiritual body that was powerful and glorious and incorruptible. Uh, that, that is not something that I can test scientifically the way I experience the rest of life. I can't taste it, touch it, feel it, smell it, or hear it. The only way that I can accept that it's true is based upon my faith because uh, faith, it, it provides evidence for things I can't see. But, but I can tell you why I have that faith. Because in Matthew chapter 9, when you get down to oh, verse uh, 18, when Jesus is speaking... Uh, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hands on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose, followed him, and so did his disciples. Skip down, if you would, to verse 23. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, Make room, for the girl's not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. When the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. I want you to understand that... Uh, these people weren't stupid. I, I hear critics of the Bible say, well, Jesus didn't really die, He just swooned. And all these resurrection miracles that you read about in the Bible, they didn't really happen. You know, those people weren't real smart. They couldn't tell when someone was dead. And, and they didn't know anything about brain dead. And they didn't know anything about this dead and that dead. Come on. We hadn't even figured out how they built the pyramids, folks. With all of our technology and all of our education, don't tell me that these were stupid people who couldn't figure out when someone is dead. Jesus goes in, and because Jesus has the power over life, and not only the life force, but the body that, it, that that life force inhabits, because Jesus has that power, He can say to the girl, Arise, and the girl arose. And this is not the only time. Luke chapter 7, uh, the, the son of the widow woman in name, John chapter 11, Lazarus. Dead four days. And if you think that it, it wasn't on purpose that Jesus waited so Lazarus would be dead four days. Uh, even they said, don't roll that stone away. The body's decomposed to the point that there's a stench. Why, why did Jesus wait to prove that He has that power? I mean, He, he raised Himself. John chapter 10, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it up again. That's why I think in John 20 when He dies... It says Jesus yielded up His Spirit. He chose to leave that body. And three days later, He chose to come back into that body. I can make my spirit leave my body. I can kill myself. But I cannot raise myself again. Only God has that power. But God promises me He'll exert it in my behalf. Do you believe that? If you don't, you should. Because the miracle that Jesus offers here is offered... On this occasion, I think the reason Matthew puts this all together is to help us to understand when God makes us a promise that we can't prove in, in our world, it is still a promise that is believable. So don't be afraid of dying. Because what God offers to us is something much greater. No, number three, I, I want you to appreciate that uh, as we go through these miracles here, uh, Jesus has the power to reward the very faith that we're talking about. Uh, this is a kind of a, 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 an interesting consideration because almost every religious organization that considers itself Christian will agree on one point. This, and, and I guess this is probably one of the few points that nearly every religious person agrees on who calls themselves Christian. And that is you've got to have faith. Uh, without faith, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, it's impossible to please Him. And I don't know any, I've never met anybody who calls himself any kind of Christian in the most general way who will, who will tell you, no, you don't have to trust God. No, everybody believes this. I mean, the question very often boils down to what is biblical faith? And, and, and the reality is, it is the concept of trust. And we would probably do well when we talk to people 
as we're reading our Bible, it is the word that we use that best describes the concept. You trust someone who you have put your confidence in, and if they tell you to do something, you do it because you trust them. And it's not an effort, it's not an, an, an issue of, I, 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 I have faith in God and somehow or the other that's a work that earns my salvation. That's not the way trust works in, in any other relationship. The reality is, you and I have the capacity to determine what's going to happen to us when we die because what God asks of us is to put our faith in Him. And, and by the way, if somebody says, well, you believe in salvation by works and I believe in salvation by faith, you, you know what you need to say to them? No, God says we're saved by our faith. Don't be scared. Don't be scared of that statement. It is the truth. Now, the baptism or the repentance or the confession or how we worship or how we act, all those are faith. They are expressions of my trust in God. But don't be afraid. Paul makes the argument in Romans, we are justified and made innocent by our trust. But the question is, how do I know? How do I know that if I live every day of my life expressing my trust in God, that God's going to forgive me and take me to heaven when I die and save me? How do I know He's going to reward my faith? I can't test it like I can prove that this is here. <laughs> and the interesting answer is, uh, we prove our faith by faith. But that faith is well grounded. Because as Jesus is on His way to the to the centurion, to the ruler's daughter's uh, bedside. You'll notice the part we skipped over in Matthew 9 and verse 20. Suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. She said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned around and when he saw her said, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And that woman was made well from that hour. What Jesus does is He pours His blessings out upon someone simply because they trusted in Him. They trusted He had the power. They trusted He could fix what she needed, what, what her problem was. She trusted Him. And Jesus rewards her because of it. And, and that, is a, that is an abused and perverted thing. Do you think Jesus would have uh, healed this woman if she didn't come touch the hem of His garment? You ever thought about that? I hear people say, well, you know, you don't have to do anything. You just have to trust. This woman trusted. What if she hadn't done anything? It's interesting, isn't it? The reality is you can get bogged down in all of that and fail to appreciate that the power of Jesus is being exerted simply because the woman trusted Him. And, and, and I know it was the power of Jesus. When you read Mark's account and Luke's account, uh, it, Jesus said, power went out from me. In fact... It's another one of those accounts that are almost humorous because they're in a crowd of people and, and he says, who touched me? And the apostles go, what? There's a, there's a thousand people crowding around us. Everybody's touching you. And he, no, I, power went out from me. He knew exactly who touched him. And he knew he was, he was testing them and testing her. And she fessed up to it. And what he said is, the faith that you have is the reason that I healed you. And make no mistake, I, again, I don't know everybody here. You may be here uh, at, at, at the invitation, and you, you may have been caught up at some point in all the faith healing stuff that you see going on, which is kind of seen a resurrection. Saw that more when I was a kid, and then for a long time you didn't see it. Now, it seems like you, you see it everywhere again. And, and there's always somebody that doesn't get healed. I've, I've got a friend that went to a faith healer, and he has uh, his leprosy. And he, and he walked up and showed him and said, heal me. And the faith healer tried it two or three times. And as, as you can figure out, it, it didn't heal him. And basically the, the explanation is, well, uh, you, you, you don't have enough faith. The power's not in this woman's faith, folks. The power's in God. The power was in Jesus. The condition was her faith. And the reality is, your faith and my faith has the potential for eternal life, salvation, resurrected body. And, and we can get up every day and live the way we're living with some confidence. Don't be afraid to go serve the Lord thinking, I, man, I hope. I hear people pray, you know, Lord, uh, we, we thank You that we have a chance to go to heaven when we die. I understand what we're saying when we're saying that, but I'm going to tell you what we need to be saying. 
Lord, we thank you for the promise that we're going to go to heaven when we die. You say, well, I, you know, I don't want to sound overconfident, but your confidence is not in yourself. Your confidence is in the God that promises you. And we need to have that kind of confidence. And Jesus has proven to us that our faith will be rewarded. So let's go live lives of faith. One last one. Not only does the miracles that we find here prove to us that Jesus has the power to forgive sins and the power to give life and the power to reward faith, uh, but, but I want you to notice also that He, that he gives us the power to see truth. Uh, the power of illumination. Uh, what we're seeing in the world, I, I think the, the, the last I saw the fastest growing religion in this country, I think was Islam, if I'm not mistaken. But I'll tell you something else that's growing, and this is kind of one of those uh, ironies again, is, is this kind of mysticism, this Eastern uh, uh, kind of uh, hard-to-describe religions, these, these, these felt kind of religions. They're, they're very popular, uh, especially with people uh, who are dismissive of traditional Christianity or Judaism or things like that, where you have standards. This, this kind of subjective, I feel it uh, world. And, and the question, and I tell you, this is a question we need to entertain with people. Uh, who's really given us the truth? How, how do I know what kind of faith, what kind of religion to pursue? Should I, you know, should I, should I go up on a mountain and, and talk to some... Uh, Eastern wise man, you know, should I should I look and see what Islam's all about? Should I should I look at some of the uh, the Latter Day Saints or uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses? How do I know that they're not telling me the truth? How do I know that Christianity is the way? Jesus makes it very clear. He says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me." That's a bold statement. How do I know that? Well, I'm, I'm the. the the gospel is intended to open our eyes to who we are, who we, who we were made to be. I mean, John chapter 1 begins with, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, uh, the, 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 the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, in Him was life, uh, and the life was the light of men. And John takes that image of light and he runs through the entire gospel with the idea that I am the light of the world. Jesus says it, what, three different times specifically in John? And, and, and what He offers is illumination. Here's who you were made to be. Here's how you came to be. Here's how I came to be. Here's what God has in store for you. Here are His promises. Here's what He's done. Here's the whole package. Now you know. Now you have a purpose and a destiny in life. You young people, you're going to have to grapple with this. What's my function? What's my purpose? Why am I here? Jesus offers that. And the question, that the, the same question we've been asking all evening, how do I know that Christianity is the way, the truth, and the life? Well, I know because of my trust, but I want you to also appreciate, if you go to Matthew chapter 9, that there is a significant miracle that involves illumination here. Verse 27, when Jesus departed there, that is from raising the girl from the dead, two blind men followed Him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when He came into the house, the blind men came to Him, and Jesus said, Do you believe I'm able to do this? And they said, Yes, Lord. He touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. I want you to understand the significance of Jesus opening the eyes of the blind. It is very much a part of the Isaiah prophecies about the Messiah. But there is a significance to it that goes beyond just it being a peculiar miracle. And the significance is, if He can open the eyes of a man physically, He can open our eyes spiritually. And unless you think, well, you know, that's kind of a stretch. Let's finish by turning to John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, in verse 1, Jesus and the apostles are... Uh, walking through the temple, and it says, Jesus, as He passed by, saw a man who was blind from birth, and His disciples asked Him, Rabbi, who sinned? That this, or was it this man or His parents that He was born blind? And 
Jesus' reply is, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Isn't it interesting that Jesus knew that? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Jesus knew why this man was born blind. He was born blind for what was about to happen to him right then. And so Jesus, again, I'm the light of the world. Notice the correlation between blindness and illumination. And so in verse 6, he spat on the ground. He anointed the, uh, the, the, the man's eyes with the clay. Tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. He does, and, and his vision is restored to him. And then there's a big argument through the rest of the chapter with regards to who healed this man. He's brought before the Sanhedrin, or at least the local council. And, and, and they, they argue, they bring his parents in, uh, and, and they threaten to put him out of the synagogue. They finally do put him out at communicating. Because the whole time he's arguing, this guy opened my eyes and, and only God can do that. He even goes so far as to say, do you want to be his disciples too? And they're like, oh, we're Moses' disciples. This guy you're following, he, he does miracles on the Sabbath day. What a heathen he is. When it's over, and here's the interesting part. Verse 35, Jesus heard they cast him out and he found him and said, do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus says, no, no, Think about what he says. You have both seen him. <laughs> this man hadn't seen very many people in his life. But he had seen God. You've both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And his reply is, Lord, I believe, with good reason. This man's eyes were opened in ways you and I could never imagine. And when the man who opened his eyes told him, I'm God, he had every reason to believe it. And, and, and so Jesus says to him, For judgment I've come into the world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. That's not a statement where Jesus is addressing physical reality. He's addressing the very thing we're talking about. How do I know Jesus' way is the way? How do I know it's not Confucius or Buddha or some religion? How do I know? Because Jesus says, I came into the world so, th so that people could see. And I know that's what He means because the Pharisees in verse 40 says, uh, they, they were with Him and heard these words, said, are we blind also? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains with you. In other words... If you, if you really understood your, your, your lack of knowledge of God, then I could heal you. But you think you can see and you are blind. Jesus uses this miracle to prove the very point we're making in Matthew 9. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You want to go to heaven? Serve Jesus. You want to be resurrected from the dead and live eternally in a powerful, glorified body? Put your faith in Jesus. You want to have your sins forgiven where you don't have to walk around in this life bearing the burden of your guilt and dragging that around? Then you give your service and your trust to Jesus. And He's proven to us He can do those things. And that makes a difference to me, folks. I, I am... Uh, in our family... Uh, and, and I'll mention this tomorrow night. In our family, I'm the resident skeptic and cynic and pessimist. And, 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 and just because you tell me something, bless your heart, you may be the most honest person in the world, but I want you to understand something. Till I get to know you, <laughs> don't think that I'm just going to trust you because you tell me something. I, that's, that is not my disposition. I have absolutely no doubt about my faith. I have absolutely no skepticism about my God. There's nothing cynical in my mind about the promises that God has made to me, even though there is absolutely no way I can prove them other than the fact that Jesus did some miracles very specifically so you and I could sit here 2,000 years later and live lives of trust with confidence. Are we not? the most blessed of people. So the question then is, what do we do with this? If you're a Christian, you're going to go out, you're going to, you're going to live with a little more confidence, you're going to have a little more trust and forgiveness, you're going to worry a little bit less about what's happening in this world because you're looking to the next one. 
You're going to talk to people more about the gospel because you can show them that this is illumination and God proven. Are you going to use this or, or do you just dismiss it? And if you're not a Christian, I want to say this as kindly as I know how. I challenge you to find anything that man or power beyond this world has offered to you that has more foundation behind it than does the gospel of Jesus Christ. I challenge you to go do that. And if you're honest, you'll come back and you'll serve the Lord. We can help you do that tonight. We invite your response while we stand.